Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. It is our three of the Jeff Santos Show, and welcome to it, folks. Uh, again, coming to you live from the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We are uh, going to be speaking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield at the bottom of the hour. Get his take, of course, uh, with SeaTac, where uh, my, the first $15 minimum wage uh, was uh, passed. Uh, that's just uh, south of Seattle. Of course, Seattle uh, now has it, um, and uh, many other cities around the country um, have it. Um, and, of course, it passed in Florida. And just, folks, just to think about all of this, um, you know, it, it is, it is um, hard for me to really understand um, how somebody, and now eight Democrats or seven Democrats, and Angus King who coxes with the Democrats, uh, independent from Maine, uh, can vote against this uh, in this time when Joe Biden is saying today that some 10 million Americans are, are still without a job. And if you listen to our good friend, uh, Mr. Uh, Rob Scott from the EPI, who was on yesterday, it, it is closer to 20 million Americans when those who are not figured that are unemployed, that they uh, not, are already given up on reporting. Uh, when you think about the folks that are are, are you know, in a situation where they're working at a McDonald's for 10 bucks an hour, uh, if they're lucky in some states, uh, and then work at a 7-Eleven at night. That means they're not spending time with their uh, wife or their husband uh, or kids, so the kids uh, don't have the parental um, uh, needs that they have. All of this, to me, represents, represents, um, you know, a emergency need. And that's why I talked in the last hour about Joe Biden using this as an emergency. Because if you don't look at it in that way, you're never going to get it done. Obviously, for him to allow the two senators from Delaware to me uh, that this was already planned, and it to me is, is disgusting, completely disgusting. Uh, next week, we look to have some uh, big news uh, of the uh, Jeff Santo show, and look forward to telling you that. Uh, and uh, we look to have our good friend Ben Jealous on uh, next week as well. Uh, this from, uh, again, some angry, frustrated uh, listeners of the Jeff Santo Show. This from my good friend Wayne in the great city of Chicago. Uh, you know, it's what I've been telling you, Jeff. I got my job and health benefits and perks. You get yours. The Dems don't care as long as they have a job. They're showing everybody who they are. Well, Wayne, you are correct. Uh, hopefully there are more Democrats that are going to run and more Democrats who can uh, defeat, uh, particularly those uh, seven Democrats and one independent, Angus King, uh, and show them uh, the road to going back home and get some real Democrats, real progressives uh, in the uh into the United States Senate. All right, our next guest comes to us from the great city of Seattle, which has led us in a, uh, a number of ways, including the minimum wage, uh, the great town of SeaTac, uh, of course, where the airport is, is um, was the first in the country. And uh, like many other things, Seattle has led on uh, medical marijuana, uh, legalizing marijuana, a number of things. Uh, that's where we find our next guest. He, of course, is the renaissance man of the Jeff Santo Show, a great musician, great reporter, and activist. Time to talk to MTC. He is in the house. He is Mark Taylor Canfield, and he joins us on the phone from uh, the great 206. Uh, Mr. Canfield, how are you, sir? Well, I'm doing good. We're trying to do a music video today, and we're on this deadline for the film festival. They asked us to submit a film. We just said, well, do a music video. It's about cannabis, which is something that Seattle and Washington State has led the country on in terms of legalization and stuff. But other than that, it's been really rainy, which is typical for Seattle. We're used to these fall springs, and then we get two weeks straight of dreary rain. But we've all got big screen TVs, so, you know, we're sitting around reading books and watching, you know, binge-watching old episodes of The Expanse or The Mandalorian. Or I like uh, the 1950s stuff, The Untouchables. That's great. Or I personally, Jeff, I like the History Channel, and I like the, the Oak Island guys. I just love this whole idea that they're searching for this treasure up there, and you never know what's going to happen next. And I actually played a Greek priest in a History Channel series called Unnatural Histories at one point where I play this Greek uh, priest at the Temple of Delphi. So I'm, I actually have done some professional acting, and I, I have this soft spot, you know, for the History Channel, because uh, I think 
they have some pretty good programming, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff on that channel. But, you know, like I was saying, you know, when you called, it's also a highlight of my day to talk to my favorite talk show host because you guys have your finger on the pulse of the nation. You know exactly what's going on. And, you know, this latest experience with uh, the $15 an hour minimum wage is something that I take to heart because, as you said, it all started here. And so watching, you know, any kind of compromise on $15 an hour is just ridiculous. And, and the thing that I wanted to tell everybody today is that there is a local chain in Seattle. It's called Dick's Drive-In. And it's been around since the 1950s. I mean, it's old school. Some of them are just drive throughs There's no seating or anything. But they have been around forever. And they have been paying, you know, above minimum wage for their employees for a long time. They also offer medical and dental benefits. Um, they have scholarships in case people want to go on to a higher education. And they have paid volunteer days so if you decide that you want to go help out the local food bank or something for the day they will pay you to do that so if dick's drive-in which is a local chain and by the way everybody supports them because they know that they treat their employees so well if dick's drive-in can do that in a local area like seattle and puget sound area and they can afford to do it then a multi-billion dollar company like mcdonald's can surely afford to pay its workers a livable wage, a sustainable wage, especially in a place like Seattle where the rents are so expensive. So that's what I've been thinking about today, Jeff, is that model, which should be repeated across the country, but for whatever reason isn't. And that's really yeah. disappointing to me. Well, I, you know, I think one of the things that we have to learn is that, um, you know, the, the protest movements, uh, you know, the leadership that you've had, uh, and Ms. Sawant for years, uh, and, and uh, the former congressman, Mr. McDermott, and uh, now Ms. Jayapal heads the Progressive Caucus. You know, you have great political leadership there, which has grassroots support that support them, and therefore they can bring, uh, you know, the powerful message. And, and an example, you know, of Ms. Jayapal, she was on a conference call with Larry Cohen, uh, the head of the Our Revolution organization, and... I was listening in the other day, and they were talking about ways to bring in uh, Medicare for All. They were talking about, you know, how to get the $15 minimum wage, you know, through the Senate. This is obviously uh, on Monday night, uh, you know, before what happened today. Uh, you know, there are people that come out of your great uh, city uh, and region, um, you know, that, that really get it. But unfortunately, there are parts of this country that are bought and sold for that have long forgot what it is to be a person who makes ten or twelve dollars an hour and needs fifteen uh, to think about you know stability that needs two k a month. I saw in washington d c when I lived there for a few years literally people in the in the metro section or the metro uh, is in washington d c just a, a few blocks from the White House. They would literally be people in suit and ties and uh, you know and, and gucci um, um, uh, briefcase that would literally step or over a, a homeless person and you know like they weren't there um, this is this is the crowd unfortunately uh, and again it's not everyone I mean there are great people there like Miss Jayapal like Bernie Sanders uh, you know there, there's Miss Bowman uh, out of New York Miss Cory Bush from you know, St. Louis there, there, are, there are a bunch of people. There's probably 100 members of the, of the Democratic caucus in the House. But there are too many who are bought and paid for um, and are selfish and greedy. Uh, and, and frankly, they don't deserve to be uh, reelected. And a lot of those people uh, that are you know, of the seven Democrats, uh, they've been there already too long. They've been there for over 10 years. I'm talking about Angus King of Maine. I'm talking about Ms. Shaheen of, uh, of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm talking about John Tester of Montana. Uh, I'm talking about a Carper of Delaware. Uh, Coons who replaced uh, uh, Joe Biden, by the way. So that's what we have. And uh, frankly, that's why we need uh, good young people and then people who are middle-aged as, uh, as well out there, uh, you know, pushing uh, to make uh, better change for America. And I know that that's something that you cover a lot uh, when you cover city council and other other uh, local areas in Seattle, uh, Mark. Yes, and I do believe that it, these eight Democrats who defected on the $15 hour minimum wage, they have to just be put in the category uh, of 
like the new CEO, Andy Jassy of, of Amazon, as basically big business versus the working class and, and the average person, because that's the way it all comes out. And, you know, really, that's not what the Democratic Party should stand for. Uh, representatives who call themselves Democrats should stand for. I mean, I don't care if, you know, Amazon raises its minimum wage or whatever. I'm talking about some of the, the money that's been put into campaigns to defeat progressive city council members in Seattle. I'm talking about uh, Amazon and some of their cohort opposition to the corporate tax here for businesses that make over $25 million a year. You know, there was there have been attempts to sort of try to keep it a little bit. And uh, I don't see that happening when you can't even get a $15 an hour minimum wage passed. I've met and interviewed Robert Reich, and, you know, I've been watching watching his tweets. He's brilliant, of course, on this issue. I've seen some other people who have tweeted some things that I've retweeted about, let's face it, we're paying these senators, what, about $4,000 a week, uh, which comes out to, if they work 40 hours a week, which, which you know, who knows, um, then, you know, it's around $93 an hour. So that's what we're paying them to tell us that we can't make a $15 an hour minimum wage that's no. That doesn't wash. I'm sorry. Uh, we're talking about trillions of dollars being spent, um, billions of dollars being uh, accrued by people like Bezos and Elon Musk and all these people and the Bill Gateses, and yet, and yet we can't even afford to pay uh, the average worker fifteen dollars. I mean, how do how do they justify that? I don't get it. They need to. We need to get younger people in office to run for the Congress on a platform that represents what their best interests are, not the best interests of people who are already in power and are already making a lot of money. Thank you. Well, I tell you, Mark, uh, you know, there are, there are good people, and the example of this is that um, when Ms. Sawant, the, uh, the Democratic Socialist, uh, uh, the great city councilor, and now the business community is, is going after her. Uh, you know, this is what it is. And, again, it comes down to the financial uh, support. Um, you know, when you want to help uh, working class people, uh, 2K a month, very popular, about 70% of the American people would like that for a six-month window to help us get through to infrastructure. Uh, when you think about the minimum wage, again, I think David Paologos, our great pollster, close to 60%, 59, I believe, was the number who supported it. Uh, yet, uh, Democrats find a way to screw themselves, find a way that they, they, they don't understand. And, you know, the other part of this that really, to me, is important, uh, and as somebody who lives in an urban sector, uh, and I used to up until recently, um, I'm now more of a suburban guy, but, uh, you know, we are, we are basically allowing rural states, the two senators are from New Hampshire, Hassan and, and Shaheen, uh, John Tester from Montana, uh, Mr. Um, Manchin from West Virginia, to basically tell the rest of the country uh, with massive populations in, in urban areas like New York, like San Francisco, like uh, Los Angeles, like Chicago, Detroit, so on and so forth, Boston, you go Miami, go on and on. Millions of people, and they are the ones that are stopping it. This, this to me, makes absolutely no sense in representation. Meanwhile, D.C. doesn't have it. Meanwhile, Puerto Rico doesn't have it. And there are millions of people uh, told, all connected, that frankly are not being uh, represented and not being represented uh, by other senators who are basically giving them the middle finger, uh, you know, by, by voting like they did today. It's really disgusting. I hope that I can encourage more musicians and artists to get out there and speak out about this, too, because, yes. I mean, we're a part of the working class. We're, we're trying to make it in a very depressed economy, the worst probably since the Great Depression. And instead of, you know, an FDR-type initiative coming out to try to help um, balance the scales and lift people out of poverty, what we get is corporate interests which have taken over our political system. And until we get all this money out of politics and figure out a way of keeping the billionaires from trying to not only bankroll the candidates but be the, the candidates themselves and you know we're, we're looking at a really messed up set of values I think our priorities are pretty messed up when you look at the fact that 
um, people should be making at least what twenty three dollars an hour by now if if um, wages according to Reich, if, you know if wages had kept up with um, productivity gains over the last seventy years and if you think about where people are today and maybe like where my father was uh, when he was I was thinking about how my father had long-term job security. A good working-class job. You were able to buy a house and own a couple cars and a boat and enjoy your life, you know, and have a good retirement with a good pension. And that's what people should be working for, not corporate readers who take all the money and leave you know, the dregs to the rest of us and then get their type of candidates elected to office to represent that point of view when the majority of the people obviously are not going to benefit from the status quo the way it is and for the last year people have been really struggling just to get by so this is kind of a slap in the face to the working people of america and i hope that more musicians start thinking about it and writing songs about this and really getting involved politically and maybe running for office themselves because we really need some new voices especially in the u.s congress they're about 20 years behind the times on so many issues and i'm so tired of the divisiveness and the complete obfuscation and obstructionism that goes on there. I mean, we really need to get things done in this country, and, and we need people in office who are proactive and are solution-oriented and are not just there to pad their own pocketbook and the pocketbooks of their supporters. That's been going on way too long. So I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe another Bernie Sanders revolution where we need a whole new uh, cadre of uh, young people running for office under that kind of a banner, and just taking over the Democratic Party, because this is not going to wash with people who are out there struggling to make it with a family right now. It's just, I hear you. It doesn't look good for the Democrats at all. It, it doesn't. Uh, let's go to the phones. I'm going to take uh, calls from John and and, uh, and Steve, uh, I, mean, I should say uh, Mark in San Francisco here, because I know they have a lot to say. And, and when you bring in your dad, you, you know, you think about a lot of ours, uh, you know, where our fathers and, and others came uh, it came from and where how they were able to you know bring us up as children and and be able to put together uh, you know working uh, working class uh, middle class family well that 's obviously been disappearing uh, every year over the last forty years uh, John, I know you remember that when you grew up in New York uh, oh, what yes. say you on yeah. this issue that now resonates itself when we cut back. Um, again, when giving the opportunity to give somebody a, a, um, a helping hand with a minimum wage increase, uh, once again shot down by a selfish seven selfish Democrats and the entire you know, Republican uh, Party. Yeah, uh, you know, both my wife and I are both have always been on the progressive left and my wife has even been on the socialist left and um, you know I've always had empathy for people who you know had it worse than me the working class and my I come from a working class background and my your wife dog is also very excited middle. about you know about this issue go ahead <laughs> yeah and and you know I, my my wife comes from an upper middle class background but her father was from, you know, poverty, just out and out poverty, and he was given a chance by the GI Bill. You know, he got his Ph.D. He worked for Boeing. He's a math- he was a mathematical genius, a very humble person, you know. But, um, you know, I, I, and he never forgot where he came from either. But, you know, so many of these people, it's like they have this let them eat cake. Um, they don't understand uh, what and they don't want to understand, uh, you know, here's your crumbs. And uh, there's a, a very, I think, kind of din- dynamic going on in this society where people look down their nose at the next person instead of we're all in this together. And in social democracies, it really, it exists, but uh, that was in the 19th century in Holland. That was in the 19th century in Denmark. That was in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century in, in Norway and in these Scandinavian countries. And you know what? You know why Minnesota is populated by uh, the second largest uh, uh, white population, uh, immigrant population, were Norwegians. Why? Because it was a society that was divided very much like this one right now, except they had the aristocracy. You know, it was a little bit different. But they had an elite class, 
and they all took everything. They were doing fine. And then you had, you know, horrible poverty uh, amongst the population. And you know what? I mean, in nature, uh, there are a lot of very talented, interested, good, decent, wonderful people that are poor, that if given a chance, uh, they, in turn, would help other people. I yeah. mean, we could have a society... Yeah, not, no, I mean, that's that what government's supposed to do. Earth. You know, it's not yeah, just about just somebody, you know, being a, uh, uh, a right. good man or a good woman and giving them you know, 10 right. bucks. That's all well and good, but if you don't have an organized society it, to help people maintain it, yes, then the 10 yes, bucks or the 20 yeah. bucks or the $100 or, or the, the $1,000 that somebody gives to a foundation is never going to get there. I mean, you don't have the government right. system. And, you know, and it's that, you not know, all about social mobility and meritocracy you know uh each each class you know in a healthy society what we had from world war ii until the early 1970s like harvey k said is yeah. up uh, until know, up until 66 is when it all began yeah, to fall and, apart and there yep. was no there was no reason why that couldn't have continued except that very powerful people in this country and throughout the world for that matter you know used uh, think tanks and every lever that they could possibly do to manipulate the population, yep, and then that convince so true. them. You know, yeah. by propaganda. No, you're you're exactly and, right, yeah. uh, John. Yeah, anyway, you're, I'm sorry. I, yeah, that's sorry, okay. We can get you started. We can do this for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't give up yeah. cocoa because uh, Senator Sanders said. If any senator believes this is the last time they will cast a vote on whether or not to give a raise to 32 million Americans, they are sorely mistaken. We're going to keep bringing it up, and we're going to get it done because it is what the American people demand and need. Meanwhile, Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman said that every single senator who voted against a $15 an hour minimum wage today should be forced to live on seven twenty-five an hour so they can prove to the rest of us how it's possible. I love it, and I hope that he ends up being the next senator from Pennsylvania. Uh, and I would, if I was Joe Biden, I'd pick him right now and ask the governor, Governor Wolf, there of uh, of Pennsylvania, to do just that. Uh, thank you for the great comments, uh, John. Before we take the call in with Mark, uh, I, I just think that you know, uh, again. Uh, the Democratic Party losing uh, working class voters. They lost a ton of white voters. They've lost 7% of African American voters to Donald Trump. It's disgusting and embarrassing. And a good 12% of Latinas. You keep up doing what they did today to people of color, to white Americans, uh, to people who are Latino and Asian, you're going you're gonna to see those numbers double, tragically enough. Uh, let's go to San Francisco, uh, where there's a tremendous homeless problem uh, in uh, the great uh, city by the bay. Uh, Mark, you're next with uh, Mark Taylor Canfield. You, you know, uh, Jeff, I'm thinking that maybe uh, Washington, Oregon, and California ought to get together uh, and do a, a Medicare for All, uh, even do a pension uh, a plan for West Coast, and also $23 an hour, uh, and just all three states work together and get this done, and uh, and maybe this will be the way to... to uh, bring in other states, if we could get together and do this, uh, you know, because there's, a, there's enough there to make it worthwhile, uh, I, I think that might be the way to go. Hey, I'm open for it. You know, there's a whole thing, Cascadia, Mark, that I uh, thought about a few years ago was British Columbia, um, Oregon, and, and, and Washington State. I'm not sure if they ever went down to the Bay Area, but why not include them? Uh, I think that that's uh, a great idea. Regional government gives you better education, better health care, uh, you know, gives you a, uh, a better minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. You can do a lot that way. Obviously, what's happening in Washington isn't working. Yeah, Cascadia is an idea that hasn't gone away. And there, there's actually even a flag that people have created with an evergreen tree on it. And uh, people fly that flag, you know, from Northern California to British Columbia. And it's not like some kind of militant secessionism or anything. Not at all. It's a very peaceful, loving kind of idea that people just think uh, a, a lot alike in those areas. Our environment is very similar, uh, the forests and the ocean and Yorkas and all of that. So we're all kind of together on a lot of those kinds of issues. And meanwhile, the NDP, which are basically the Democratic Socialists, are in the majority in the parliament in British Columbia. And when I was covering that election, the CBC had interviewed voters and asked them, why, you know, did you vote for the NDP this time? And they said, because they were sending us checks in the mail. And I was able to pay my rent and keep a roof over my head. Why would I not vote for them? And if the Democrats don't figure that out, 
then they're not going to be in the majority. You know, obviously the NDP figured that out in British Columbia and are now are, are now running a much more progressive agenda in that province. So hopefully the rest of us can follow suit. You know, there are conservatives on the east side of Washington State and Oregon who yeah. are Republican. Yep. No, I, I hear you. Check out my song on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, and keep buying tickets to the Kraken. I think you're going to like hockey in Seattle, uh, Mark. Hey, we'll talk more about that next week. Appreciate uh, your insight. Mark from San Francisco, thank you for the call. And John as well. In fact, the calls were just off the wall today. They were fantastic. Uh, a rating. Thank you, listeners. I want to thank Ron Kreider for producing this broadcast. I want to thank uh, all of the, the folks who tune in and, uh, and text and, and tweet. Uh, we'll be back next week, hopefully with some big news. Until then, folks, keep on fighting peacefully. My name is Jeff Santos, and it's my time to say I gotta go!